There we go. Welcome to FBB Forum. I'm very pleased to welcome the beautiful IFBB Women's Physique Pro, Christina Speckos. Is that the right pronunciation for your last name? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Christina has been competing in bodybuilding since 2016, and her most recent show, which was also her pro debut, was the Daytona Pro, uh, where she placed fourth in the over 35 category for Masters. Welcome, Christina. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me and for doing this for the women of the sport. I love your interview style and how everyone gets to talk about the human side of being an athlete and a professional in, in what we do. So I really appreciate your perspective and your support for on behalf of all of us. Well, thank you so much. That's really nice. I appreciate that. Um, well, first questions, I'm going to ask you about how you got started in bodybuilding. And I was curious, um, did you have an athletic or sports background uh, before you started in bodybuilding? Before high school, I kind of dabbled, you know, I was a kid. So I actually a competitive uh, Snickers eating <laughs> early, early on, you know, I didn't really have a lot of sports background until I got to middle school. I dabbled in field hockey, um, but in tennis, in high school, I played tennis, so I was always like the short, stocky, power build type of type of athlete. And I took a liking to weightlifting probably my sophomore year of high school because wow. I just I, I really wanted I will. Of course, I went into athletic performance later as a coach. So I really wanted to improve my tennis performance because skill wise, I wasn't the best. But like work ethic wise, I knew I could put in a lot. <laughs> That's great. That's really early to start weightlifting, too, in, in sophomore year of high school. Yeah, and I actually was around, ironically, my mom's not that fit <laughs> growing up, but she had a lot of fitness videos. It was the 80s. So I actually got into a lot of fitness early on when I'm a kid, like in the 80s with leg warmers and stuff. So fitness oh, yeah. was always a part of like the background, but I was never a competitive athlete until I got to public school in high school. And then it became like a thing that my friends and I just did together. We played tennis and we just decided to go on the team. <laughs> That's terrific. That's great. Um, I was curious, how did you get started in bodybuilding and, and who convinced you to do your first contest? I love this question because I remember it just like it was yesterday. I was actually 36 years old and I was it was like the divine timing. I was coming off of do like I was really diligent with my blood work after I felt like crap. And I had spent so many years coaching other people and in high pressure environments that I just kind of felt off one day and I'm like, you know what, you need to do your annual physical and like everything was out of whack from blood sugar, triglycerides, cholesterol. I'm like, I am not going down the road of any of my family members. And that actually scared me into taking action. But then what actually geared me toward bodybuilding was someone came into my office, which was a gym. You know, I was, I was a strength coach at Purdue University. So I had my office right there in front of all the weights uh -huh. and she just decided to, she was new at the school and she said, Oh, I'm going to compete. She was like a tutor or something. I'm like, well, uh -huh. I want to do that. And I've wanted to do that for years, but I never thought I could. And she had everything already set up. She had a coach that was down the street. She trusted her. And like, this is perfect for like my first experience. I had a buddy every Monday morning at 4 a.m. Got up and did our weights and our pictures and had a coach that I loved like a sister. I grew to love and still to this day. So it's, um, it was a very natural evolution that answered the problem to how I was feeling about myself, letting myself go while supporting other top athletes to my metamorphosis into being a high level athlete. That's so cool. That's awesome. And what, um, 2016 was your first contest, right? Yeah. So that year it started February ish. Um, basically the end of February was my first picture of check-ins and then the competition was September and November. So completely just dove all in. I don't know how many hours I was working out every week. And I really was diligent with counting my tablespoon of peanut butter and everything meticulously. And I loved the process. It was so new. Yeah. And I, I kind of missed that, that feeling because now, you know, as a pro, you feel like, Oh my God, it's like a business. You can't mess up any detail. And if you do, you're a bad person. The stakes are so much higher when you're yeah. competing against other people. But as as my evolution through the years went on, I tried to frame it differently every year in my mind. And I'm I'm still feeling like myself and others 
can grow in that area as we become more seasoned competitors. The mind is something that it's always much harder to work on. Yeah, that's true. There's and there's such a big mental component to bodybuilding for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, I was curious when you first started, did you have like a fitness role model? Um, and do you have the same role model now? Shout out to the first few people I was watching. So the, fr- the three main women that I watched back then were Dana Lynn Bailey and still to this day adore her. And we actually went to college together. I don't think she oh, knows yeah. me because I was two years older, but she played soccer at Westchester University in Pennsylvania. And oh. I was an athletic training major, but I happened to work with the men's soccer team. So it wasn't until afterwards that I realized that she was in school. We were we overlapped by two years. Um, but we just never knew each other. And, and then she became who she is today, um, yeah. post soccer. And then I used to watch a lot of um, Aaron Stern and um, Nicole Wilkins. Those were the three that I really loved everything about their demeanor. And then as I got more into the sport, because that was more like the figure area, even though Gina's um, women's physique, but then Julianne Malacarne is always going to be someone that I just, just everybody loves her physique and just her demeanor. So I have, I guess, three to four women that I really look up to in the sport from when I first started. That's great. Yeah, I remember um, Dana Lynn Bailey comes up a lot in this podcast, and she's just really well loved, and and she's she is a great role model too. She and being the first, you know, or physique Olympia um, winner was really awesome too. That's such a great milestone. But I, what I love the most about her is that, and I resonate with her the most because she has this like intensity and tenacity that I feel like when I'm in the gym and I think of her. Like I feel, I feel most closely like identifying with that, but she also is just super cute, super happy with everything that she does. Whereas that's where I'm the opposite. Like I can literally walk through the gym and like scare people because I'll get in my head or I'll just be super serious. And I don't know how to continue to channel that into, I love every second of it. She legitimately in all of her social media and everything that she says looks like she loves it to this day, regardless of her platform of how many people are throwing shade. And I, I'm i still growing in that area mentally where I'm like, just what would Dana do? Just be happy. I <laughs> just love what you do. Because I, I definitely like, I, I'm definitely a little bit more cold <laughs> in that respect. Sure, I understand. No, yeah, no. Um, yeah, she she's pretty amazing, and and um, I, I I wasn't surprised that she came up so much since I started this podcast. She's she's pretty cool. Um, yeah, she definitely is a pioneer for us, at least women's physique, because bikini and figure have been around. I I guess a little bit, not longer, but I, I guess the physique type is a lot more appealing to some people. Whereas I look at women's physique, and when as I evolved from figure to physique, it was like I could do this. Like I just have to diet harder, and I just have to focus. Like. Yeah. I knew I didn't have the shape of the typical curvy woman. So figure it kind of weeded me out. Yeah. And when I got to women's physique, I noticed, well, you could be super small and you could be ripped to shreds and be okay. You don't have to be tall. You don't have, you could, you could hide this, the waist that you don't have. That's, you know, not an hourglass. So I found yeah. my home there. And then I was super excited to get rid of the heels. Like I'm oh, so yeah. happy. I don't have to wear heels on stage. I bet. <laughs> I've heard that a lot. And the nice thing with them, um, as a fan, I think just getting to see your posing routine and I just think it's really creative to be able to incorporate in a full posing routine and do the flexing and everything. Yeah. And I think posing routines is somewhere I can put a little bit more time and effort into because I, I see it in my mind and then what actually happens, sometimes you um, <laughs> just get caught. You're like, keep going. No one knows that that's not supposed to be the next step. <laughs> um, but I think it's cool because it does have an artistic feel. And some of the women that really do an amazing job of having like a flawless performance, is an, they're also people I look up to is that's the next level for your craft, right? Yeah. Really being able to display it. And I have this horrible mental block where if I'm not already lean, I don't like to pose, which is awful. Like as a pro, I shouldn't be saying that. I should be saying yeah. practice and pose all of the time. Cause it doesn't that's matter true. if you could see it perfectly. That's yeah. one advice to give like the younger girls coming up, like don't worry about it. Cause yeah. I hate posing when I'm chunky, but like you got to do it anyway. Cause you have to build that stamina. Yeah, that's true. You kind of, yeah, you have to 
almost build like a muscle memory kind of thing with your routine and everything. So it's, it's hard. Try yeah. flexing for three minutes. It's like being in the ring with like Floyd Mayweather. You know, it's a lot of yeah. cardio. You wouldn't think of what it is. Oh, I bet. No, I bet it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my next few questions are about family and home life. And I was curious, um, what do your parents think about your fitness career? And are they supportive of it? They are like, they, they may not understand it firsthand, but they are. And my dad came to Daytona and I was super thrilled because he had never been to a show before and they live in central Florida. So with me in Miami and them just like sort of outside of Orlando, it was kind yeah. of perfect because it only took him maybe an hour, hour and a half to get there. So okay. I was really excited. And one my friend, Maribel, she's been, she was actually one of my first clients here in Miami and still became one of my best friends to this day. So we're like travel buddies. We go to the Olympia together every year. We already know that like, if it's bodybuilding, she's going, I'm going and we're roommates. That's so great. she kept my dad entertained. And then after this show, she was like, you know, your dad's like really proud of you. He doesn't know what he's looking at, right? Because <laughs> Daytona was a master show. So he saw like the 50 and 60s and, you know, he's almost 80. So he's seeing like yeah. his ripped man at 60, like getting up there flexing. And I think there was a part of him that was in awe. Whereas my mom, this is hilarious. There are times where I've gone home and I've been absolutely shredded, getting ready to step on stage. And she'll like poke me in the chest. She's like, where are your boobs? <laughs> Like mom, <laughs> and I'm like mom, and I'll poke her. Like, where are your boobs? Like, so it's funny because we have a different relationship than me and my dad. And then when it's like later in, like, say I compete in the summer and like a winter month, and I'm in the kitchen when I visit them, and I'm cooking like every meal, and it's literally like fish and, and chicken and veggie. She's like, "You're eating again. You're gonna get fat." I'm like, "No one got fat off asparagus, mom. Relax." So, <laughs> and then if I do get a little too hefty, she's like, "Are you gonna diet yet?" <laughs> So she kind of gets it, but she doesn't really understand. So, yeah. she, you know, they're just proud because they don't really know enough to be critical, but they're also open-minded enough to be like, she's happy, let her go. That's terrific, though. Yeah, I've, I've talked to some ladies where their parents weren't so supportive. So that's, that is nice that they're proud and, and, and support you like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a blessing. Yeah, definitely. Now, I know you live in Miami, and I was curious, have you found – Miami to be a supportive community for bodybuilding? Yeah. So when I first moved here, I was training at a really like fancy gym because I was going to work there. And then when I kind of found my way and realized I wanted to have my own business, I ended up, well, even before I moved here, I was seeing Elevation Fitness, which is one of the top bodybuilding gyms in Miami. Um, we have a couple other ones in other areas of Miami, like law at large, but this is one downtown. There's one on South Beach, everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. So I've been there for, I'm starting my fourth year at that gym. And when I walked in, I was like, oh, I'm at the mothership. So everybody there, when they were seeing me coming in like shredded, getting more shredded and then getting chunky, they're all a lot of bodybuilders and bodybuilding coaches. So one guy like a year or two ago was like, you've been eating, haven't you? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Like everybody's a coach, everybody's a critic, but out of love because they understand the process. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's supportive because when they see you grinding, like they know, don't talk to her. She's like on her second hour of cardio. And uh -huh. then when they see you transitioning, everyone's like, oh my gosh, you changed in the last month. And so it's so nice to be in a place where people understand the grind, whether they're just yeah. working out competitively for themselves daily and they'll never step on stage or whether I'm next to like an Olympian. It's it's a huge array of people that value their time there and quality time and, and fitness and wellness. Do you um, end up meeting clients, that coaching clients at Elevation also? Not really. So my background is in a lot of injury care, prevention, massage therapy, so, and I can train clients. I have had some. Um, but a lot of my clients are either online or very specialty. Like I help them come back from injuries, like from an 80 year old entrepreneur to like, I've had a client that, you know, post ACL surgery. So I love getting to work with like medical cases. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I like to round to different people's homes and help them. So it sure. didn't make sense for me to, to like stay put in one gym and just kind of be there all day. But I love my trainer who does, because it, it's so nice to have someone keep an eye on you because they yeah. basically live in the gym and. It's like, did you eat yet? Come uh -huh. on, you need to eat. It's been an hour. Go. Uh huh. That's I'm talking. <laughs> that is good to have, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you find it 
especially with your own business like you have, is it hard to juggle the demands of work life and home life for you? So home life for me is me and the dog. So theoretically on a personnel level, it should be easy. But when I look in the sink or I look at whatever and I'm like, yo, the dog didn't do that. Like you need to take responsibility for your mess. It's like, if I'm not juggling the home life, I have a serious organization problem. So uh -huh. that's when that gets bad. When I start to like look around the house and be like, yo, what are you doing? Come on now. It's only you. But then um, when it comes to work as an entrepreneur, who's constantly like, I have, I have an affinity for things like this podcasting television. You know, I filmed a reality show last year. That's going to come out this summer. And I loved the process. So I always love opportunities like that in addition to what I've done for 23 years, which is coach and train people. So no yeah. matter what you do, you feel like you're always in this rat race of a hustle because I have a hard time narrowing it down to one thing. The one thing was athletic performance coaching, but yeah. now I'm in a world where I had the opportunity to be on a reality show and I've had the opportunity to start a podcast and all of these things that like, I just feel like it's so hard to not be thinking about the next move when yeah. really the next move should be go cook your chicken. Otherwise yeah. tomorrow you're gonna be caught with your pants down and you're gonna make a bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's good to just chill at home and yeah, and not have to worry about work, you know, at least temporarily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So when I got started, it was literally the perfect timing of being in a job that paid me very, very well in a very low cost of living area and life was like simple to be able to just train all hours of the day that I needed to. Whereas now yeah. I like, I'm super, I gotta be super picky on sleep and I gotta try to turn the phone off. And then even if I turn the phone off, I gotta turn the brain off. And that's been the biggest challenge when yeah. you're constantly thinking about the next business move. Sure, I understand that. I think that's true. A lot of entrepreneurs too. That, that, that's kind of tough. Yeah. Which is funny. Cause that's the clientele I work with, which as I was kind of sharing with you earlier, it's, it's frustrating because everybody uses the excuse I'm busy. Yeah. And when I start getting into prep, like, and I have no excuses, like it has to get done whether I like it or not. You really start to lose your patience for the people that use busy as an excuse. So I have to remember to be human and coaching and nurturing, but also lay the smack down, but don't turn people <laughs> off because they're not on this level. So yeah. Busy to them needs a different solution than me. Busy for me is suck it up and prioritize because this is basically a job without getting paid for it. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, no, that's um, well, with bodybuilding like contests and stuff, there's money more money going out, so I've been coming in too. So, yeah, so, until you uh, achieve that status where you're continually winning and you're at the top, you know, echelon at the Olympia, I started late in life, and not that it's an excuse, but I, I didn't put like win at all costs on the line. Well, the year that I did, it didn't end well <laughs> for my psyche. But now when you have to have a, that energy to show up for clients and show up for your business and do things that you don't like to do until you have the capital to hire people to do it. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I've been able to outsource my social media. So that's been a huge help. But there's yeah. so many, I, like there's like 17 hats that you wear. Yeah, that, that's tough to do. Yeah. Yeah. Before I forget to tell me about this reality show, when, when is that coming out and where is it going to be shown? Because I'd love to see that. So I don't know how much I can say. Um, it's supposed to be on a streaming network. We know that. So a big streaming network. And it was filmed here in Miami. And the theme of it was like dating and matchmaking. We're on oh, yeah. a client. So it's it's supposed to come out in the summer. And, you know, they couldn't tell me anything except the producers are really, really happy with the outcome. And. And so, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll get a season two. We'll see what happens. But That's I'm terrific. excited to to find out more details as they come. That's exciting. Yeah, that definitely. Yeah. Have to, and uh, I was the weirdo bodybuilder, right? Not everybody was a bodybuilder. So my story with, you know, them following me, I think, was what was unique since the first interview with the casting director. So I'm interested to see how I'm portrayed. <laughs> am I the crazy bodybuilder or am I just like any other person, you know, looking for love or whatever? That's awesome. That sounds really cool. I've It'll had be a interesting to see. Oh, go ahead. It'll be interesting to see how it turns out. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I, I've had a concept for a reality show called um, where it's like bodybuilders who are moms. And it would be called Muscle Mamas. 
So <laughs> I just think. Can you imagine like huge women going to like, you know, with the soccer van, like to the game <laughs> and everybody looking like that would be hilarious, but also show the stigma around it, which. Yeah. Uh, like, again, I, I told you privately, but I did want to tell you like officially on here, like, thank you for doing this because there's so much of a stigma that goes around it and women or female bodybuilding, they're still this we're females, we're feminine, we still have emotions, we may be tougher than the average woman. But when you walk out there, and I have to be cognizant of this as well, like if you have a big personality, and you have a larger than life physique compared to like tiny little ladies who are always dieting on carrots or something like people don't, don't understand the, the desire to be strong and, and have a stature and that it doesn't bother us. Yeah. But you know, I just want to thank you for bringing it like more normalized <laughs> and thank showing you. us as humans because it's it's really tough when I'm not in the gym. Sometimes. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, and I'm not even that big, so I'm like, hmm, just wait till you yeah. see some of my friends. Uh -huh. <laughs> thank you. I I really appreciate that, and um, yeah, that's part of the mission of this podcast. I think is to kind of show the human side of of. Um, female bodybuilding, and I've just been a fan for so long, so it's it's an honor to get to talk to to folks like you too. So thank you, I appreciate that. I'm so glad, and and I just want to thank you for being a fan. And I was actually interested. I mean, you have more questions for me, but I was actually interested because no one gets to interview. Like, what makes you love bodybuilding, and it made you become a fan, especially on the female side of things? Because it's very easy for people to sell out tickets for like the men's shows. <laughs> Yeah. But what uh, intrigues you about what we do? Oh, I just, I'm always very impressed by just the dedication and drive that it takes to, to, to get on stage, you know, and, um, and like I said, I, I'm, I feel like I'm a little too lazy to, to do it myself, but I can tell your, help tell your story and, and um, live vicariously through, through you and the other muscle ladies, I think. So, um, but yeah, I just, I've been a fan, gosh, since I was a kid and, um, I think you guys are hot too. I'll be honest, y'all are. <laughs> so you get either you get fifty fifty. Like there are some guys in the gym that are like, like they they really have respect and they're like, you know what? I want to learn from you because obviously we're doing something right if we look better. And then there are guys that just want to like be trolls and I don't know, hide behind you know emojis <laughs> on <laughs> on Instagram and call you a man. So it's it's really fifty fifty. So yeah. well, maybe there's less that love us than hate us, but. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I really, yeah, I really admire you guys and, and like y'all a lot. So, yeah, I'm glad, uh, you know, I, I'd been um, talked into this by some friends who thought I should do this because um, um, they thought, you know, that, that I could do a good job at it. So, I, yeah, I really appreciate your feedback. I, I, and um, I really enjoy doing the podcast, too. It's been great so far. It's fun. And, and just this kind of stuff like Zoom and everything, Skype, just became so popular through COVID that we realized we really have no excuse to stay connected and really get to know one another when we have all this technology. So I, I thank technology for making this so easy. Oh yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, definitely. Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions about competition prep and coaching. Yeah. And I was curious, um, what is the toughest aspect of competition prep for you? I feel like consistently, it was the mentality and you know you already have a mentality for starting it and you stick with it you have you already have anchored that mentality if you continue with it but there's always that self doubt sometimes for everybody even if they look the best even if they've already won this that and the third there's always something in the back of your mind that like could be better so i think staying mentally tough and strong some people i'm sure maybe turn off their social media you know maybe some people um, really limit where they go. And then I admire some people who are really in the public eye at a high level that manage it so well because they're so mentally grounded. You know, I mm -hmm. tend to get a lot closer with my bodybuilding friends, ironically more male than, than female during the time of me prepping. And sure. one of them sent me a Kobe video today of saying like, he just stays calm, like taking that emotion away from whatever happens. Okay. And that's something that I feel like for me this year will be a really big growth area is emotional intelligence. Yeah. Go into the gym, meet the trainer, 
get your tail kicked, forget the outside world. He's going to make it so hard that you can't think about anything but survival. And then you're really locked in for the hour. And that's been a huge opportunity for me to grow in that area. Right. And at least for two hours a week, shut off my brain and focus on what I have to do. Because I would yeah. get distracted by everything. Donuts on Instagram to some other girl looking better to who's progress or what I think I'm not. And you just can't go down the rabbit hole. Yeah, no, I, that makes sense. I do know some competitors who switch off Instagram. So you don't have to worry about comparisons, comparing yourself to others. And there's a lot of, there's just a lot of unnecessary noise on Instagram anyway and, and other social media. So um, I try I think- so hard to get rid of it and it's still on the feed. I'm like, why are these donuts popping up? I haven't looked at a donut in months. Like, get off my feed. <laughs> that is kind of evil, isn't it? Yeah, that's not nice. It's like they know and they like spying on you and you're most vulnerable. But it's all an algorithm too. So it's the computer decided you want to see this, don't you? It's like, no. <laughs> Time yeah. of year, she's always looking up donuts. For the past three years, we've seen a twin. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> um. Speaking of food, is there a particular food item that you miss the most during prep? You know what I've learned? I've learned that when I go off plan, I really pay for it. And just health and processing is so important that we should learn that lesson and not have binges. Um, but if I have nuts in the house, you know, you, I, it's really hard to just nuts and nut butters are, are the things that when you are really going lower carb and lower fat, your body just wants it. And there was a time yeah. in the house, no cookies, nothing. And I never touched this. I had like some sort of country crock spreadable margarine thing. This was like uh-huh. six years ago. And I was so desperate. I start eating that with a spoon. And I'm like, what are you doing? Put it away. It tastes like crap. You, it's in there for, I don't know why, because I never ate it. it just was in the refrigerator. And I'm like, out like no so you you crave the dumbest things but i yeah. i like burgers, especially cheap like sushi which for some people that's healthy for us it's a little awesome. bit out of range yeah sushi is a good, yeah. seems like a meal that comes up a lot after competition from for bodybuilders that they that they kind of crave it but it is that's so tasty too i have a, a friend in bodybuilding that's like a competitor from years ago and he does not like sushi and i'm like oh how could you not like that's like our thing but there are some people that don't like it but burgers are definitely a common one yeah burgers yeah that comes up a lot too yeah <laughs> but even that like if i'm really eating on plan my stomach will just be like i hate you <laughs> really oh no. yeah <laughs> yeah it's a shame it's a shame because yeah. then you just get addicted to eating what you're supposed to eat because it doesn't hurt <laughs> Yeah, I understand. <laughs> um, I I was wanted to talk to you a little bit about your coaching career and um, how long have you been coaching now? So as a fitness professional, strength coach, performance coach, whew, since 1999, so 20, almost 24 years this year. Wow. And Great. that ranged from general population to high school and collegiate athletes, some NFL and some competitors that were entry level, I enjoy teaching up and coming competitors sure. how to get started. Um, but yeah, it's it's been and now it's a lot of entrepreneurs and, and people down here in Miami that I get the chance to work with. That's great. Do you have more lifestyle clients than you do or injury clients than you do bodybuilders? Yeah, yeah. I think the the younger entry level bodybuilder people that I've worked with, I would say bikini. Um, they, they were few and far between. Online, it's a lot easier because here, at least my perception is that in Miami, the coaches that coach everybody, like that's who I would go to if I was at my level, like as a pro. But sure. I think for some entry level people, like the way I started, my first coach was amazing and taught me how to be human and taught me how to get over the first year feels that maybe an advanced coach who only deals with pros just won't have the tolerance for. And Mm -hmm. I think that there is an Mm -hmm. opportunity for that. So I definitely welcome them and, um, and would love to, to give back to what I didn't have at that time. And I'm so mad. I didn't 
film my 2016 prep the way I said I was going to because I was searching for a YouTube blog on the process for oh. someone's first time and I didn't film it and I it would have been great. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah, that would be kind yeah. of as is just a um, even look back on, but just as a yeah, just as an exercise. To I'll kind take of a few in my phone that I find, and I'm like, man, there's only a few far in between. Like, I really wish I I did the whole thing because I yeah. Google searched every possible combination of words and searched on YouTube, and I I couldn't find the type of story that I was looking for. Really? Yeah. Maybe I'll do it this year. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> be awesome. Yeah. Um, I was curious if, if there's any coaching clients that you'd like to highlight. You don't need to name names, but if there's any that you're particularly proud of that, or that you like. Oh to my with. gosh, yeah. So she's okay with me naming her name. Uh, I have a client named Diane in New Jersey. And ironically, I lived in that similar area before I moved, but I never knew her while I lived up there. Mm -hmm. And she came to me through Instagram and we had some mutual friends. So there was already sort of like this level of trust, like, oh, you know, so-and-so knows her for 20 years. Like, let's check this out. And then everything that I would post or talk about or whatever just kind of aligned with her. So we've been together for over a year and a half now. And oh. what I want to praise about her is that her background was always in powerlifting. So there was no issue with being afraid of the gym or not wanting to lift. But when you don't understand nutrition and body composition changes, you just kind of like do whatever you, you want. And she kind of fell into that trap and she had battled like some obesity before stress, keto, you know, diet, this and that. Um, but over the last 18 months, she has been the most consistent, the most passionate, badass I could ever work with. And I'm like, you're not leaving me ever. <laughs> I'm like, we got places to go. So she's starting to look like a competitor, even though it's not in her desire to really? compete because she's just nutritionally diligent. It kind of helps to stay diligent with your nutrition when you have some food considerations. And we work through a lot of food elimination diets. I tend to get clients where I can handle these things that other coaches wouldn't have the patience for. Okay. I enjoy going through food elimination diets and helping like gut restoration and things like that, because if you yeah. can't absorb it, why, why eat it? Right. So she's been on such a journey and I just, I love highlighting her every chance I get because She's exemplary through all the good and the bad. She's intelligent. She's consistent and she's honest. She'll tell me I screwed up. Like, okay, we move forward. That's terrific. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. You have to make sure she watches this interview too. Give her. Oh, she'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Now, um, on your Instagram and in, on the title of your Instagram, Page, it, it mentions that you're a fitness concierge and I was wondering if you could kind of elaborate on that because I just haven't heard any other coach or bodybuilder use that term but I, I kind of like it too it's got a got a nice sound to it yeah I have a background in high performance athletic performance coaching and the high performance model that we had basically incorporated everything. So in college sports, you have the athlete that's like the center of everything. And you have the head coach, you have the strength coach, you have the dietitians, you have the recovery people, the athletic trainers, the tutors, the mental health professionals, like there's everybody um, basically making the wheel turn. We all have to be on the same page. And I'm like, you know what? College kids that are scholarship athletes have it best because they've access to all these professionals. They don't have to pay for it. They just yeah. dedicate four years of their life to play in their sport. And and walk away with an amazing degree from an amazing university. It's a win-win. It's not easy, but it's a win-win. I'm like, you know what? If somebody had to pay for this, what would it look like? How can I mimic that model for somebody who's too busy, has the means to do it? And so I'm bringing that model to the clientele down here. And what I'm seeing now as I'm rolling this out, it's increasing awareness to what it sounds like. So to me, concierge is like, if you're at the gold level package, like I'm literally like your, your, your assistant with everything health and wellness, because I'm the trainer, I'm the nutrition coach, I'm the massage therapist licensed in everything for like all these years now. And I could be the assistant that interfaces with your doctors, with your, well, within HIPAA, right? But like people that need to be part of what keeps you running. Yeah. And that's still something that I'm I'm working to refining because there are some people that say they're physically limited. Well, they're not doing the training piece, but they do recovery and the nutrition. So I'm experimenting with what works best for most people. But you do get some of those people that are like, you know what? I want you to come into the house, clear out everything, make sure everything's set, 
you know, we're going to set up regular training sessions. And it's a lot to put on one person because some people like that different professionals for that. But I'm like, I'm the one stop shop until it gets too big for me. So I love the idea of concierge because it's basically saying like, whatever you need, I'm the problem solver. Yeah. You have the means. So money's off the table as an issue. Yeah. It's the means of mentality and me coaching the mentality. It's the, it's the means of me finding the meal prep service that pleases you. Um, it's the, it's the means of figuring out like, what are you willing to do? Because the other devil of Miami is that we got a lot of bars, a lot of restaurants, a lot of clubs, a lot of ways to get in trouble nutritionally and, and also in other ways. So how do you stay focused in a place like this? Yeah. So as I started my, my own podcast and I'm interviewing some clients and things like that, it's a great way to, sh- to highlight the real struggles of people who aren't just going to college and have all access to all facilities and professionals. What do you yeah. do when you're in the working world and you're literally on the computer for 10 hours a day and you need to lose weight and you need to get healthy? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's a, that's really makes sense. That's a good way of um, kind of looking at it and, and the kind of unique model too for, for, um, I'm hoping that it it takes off even more than, than what I've done so far, because the model of just like show up to the gym, train, and then you're responsible for the other 23 hours of the day. I really find is the most successful for certain people. Like I know I can do it because I'm self-motivated the other 23 hours of the day. Mm -hmm. But when you really need that upper level guidance, you need more than one hour with a trainer and paying per hour it's not a waste because you still get the benefits of what you're training, but that person cannot provide that service to you and answer your call because they're with 11 other clients that day. So oh. it's, a, it's a different type of clientele that needs more, but mm-hmm. they, they, they miss out on those intangibles when they just show up for one session and leave and then screw up the other hours of the day. Yeah, I understand. Hmm. That's pretty cool. I think that's great. That's, um, um, hmm. Um, so my next few questions are about competing and, um, I was wondering when and where do you hope to compete again? And I just want to say, I hope you'll compete in Tampa this year. And maybe, um, I know that Daytona is also adding the open women's physique too. So maybe you could compete. I wanted to ask you about that. So we are officially open, like, oh, qualifier and everything this year in Daytona. Daytona is. Yeah. That's a new thing. Yeah. Good. Well, maybe that'll be on the list. We're still, um, Taking it, you know, day by day, I think right now I'm at minimum six months away from any show. Okay. So it, if, if Tampa's in the cards, hopefully Tampa's in the cards. Um, Daytona's after that, right? It's like September or something or October. Uh, like October, September, October. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I'm thinking what makes sense for me and coming from where I was um, last year, I, I think that no no sooner than august is really feasible sure that's cool that'd be great to see you compete again and I, I've been yeah following your your career on stage for a while now so yeah i was excited to see you do your pro debut in daytona although i wasn't at that show but i saw the pictures so <laughs> it's so rewarding to put them all side by side because i'm still in awe of the growth and the process and the change because in in the trenches you don't really you don't see it if you have goggles like I do. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was curious when, uh, um, for your last few competitions, what feedback or did you get feedback from the judges in terms of where to improve your physique? For Daytona, I didn't ask. I know that sounds really bad um, because we always know at that level, especially now going to bigger shows. Like for me, that was a great starter pro show because it was masters only. I'm really excited that they're open now. Um, yeah. But n- I already know that to step on a bigger stage, it's always going to be, you know, you have to have more definition. You have to be a little bit leaner and tighter. You have to have a bigger back, this and that. So feedback mm-hmm. I've always gotten over the years was get a little bit bigger, get a little bit bigger. I, they're always going to tell you to get bigger, I feel like. Yeah, um, that's true. Because it's so easy to lose it in extreme dieting. And then yeah. conditioning is always a big deal. I think that for me, a personal goal is to really create more separation in the legs. And okay. in later years, it's come a lot more because in the beginning, that was like the hardest area for me it was my lower body. Yeah. The first year is like, you know, a newbie. It was like, oh, quads. It's one big 
lump of meat, <laughs> but then it got a little more chiseled over the years with muscle maturity. So yeah, my sure. personal goal is that, but no one, no one said it, but I know that to, to really have that balance, I, I know what I need to do with creating that V taper. And, um, and for me, stomach control, like abs. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> a lot of sucking in. To keep them like when you're up on stage and keep them kind of sucked in and stuff. Yeah, and it's it's so hard to to you have to learn how to breathe without using your stomach. Yeah. And as a Pilates teacher, I should be good at it, but it's a completely different ball game. Yeah. When you are trying to squeeze everything. <laughs> no, your abs are great though. I it think. must be practiced. Yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah. Um I was curious like what is your favorite muscle group to train and and what's your least favorite? Every year, I feel like it changes. I enjoy training legs now because I have a trainer that literally squeezes every last bit of juice out of me that I know if I was by myself, I would have like convinced myself I was done. So that's a huge blessing to have, which actually I loved. I used to love back day and I used to hate legs. Now it's like, okay, I can really feel my legs better than ever before. I'm really getting like exactly where I'm supposed to be. So it kind of almost makes like back and shoulders really disappointing to train because I don't get that same feeling, even though I know it's working. Yeah, I understand. I've been able to really overreach. So I said, I would say that my least favorite, oh gosh, I need shoulders. I would say my least favorite is back horrible because I, that was my favorite. And I absolutely hate training abs. <laughs> really? Oh, no. <laughs> I know, which is probably shows because it's like I used to do so many of them. And I used to take a lot of Pilates because I teach Pilates as well. Yeah. Um, and it's just, I don't know, when you get to do so many things, like so much cardio, so much training, abs can get overlooked. And then the more you avoid it, the more you don't want to go back to it. So I've developed this <laughs> hatred for investing the time in it, but it's worth it and you have to do it. Yeah, I understand. Your abs are great though. <laughs> um, now, I was wondering, do you find it hard to, you, you mentioned you have a social media manager now, but do you find it hard to keep up with the demands of social media um, and, and dealing with the trolls and the haters too, we had talked a little bit about and um, but do you get a lot of DMs too and, and comments on your posts? I wouldn't say a lot, a lot because I'm very fortunate that I don't have the problem of like two million followers where you have more eyeballs. However, the content that they're putting out is quality. I went more like the educational route with the content that I'm putting out. So yeah. I'm, I am getting a lot of positive feedback on the aesthetics and the quality of the information. Um, but I do get some people that like, when I filmed it, it was months ago when I was kind of coming out of like a carrot cake haze, it was like, <laughs> just not really into it. And I was like, I'm never competing again. And then I realized like, I got into it for a reason and yeah. I loved myself when I got into it. And I was at my best self when I was really disciplined. I'm like, why would I abandon what made me as ferocious as I was in that time period? And in the years that I didn't really train that way, and I went to like carrot cake bill, like, you're not happy, like go back to what you love. So yeah. when we filmed the content, I was a little thicker. I was probably about 10 ish pounds bigger than this. It was all in my face. You could totally uh -huh. tell. And of course the cameraman I'm friends with is like right here. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> but I saw the content. I was like, just close your eyes and just go down the roller coaster because we're going to film again with this <laughs> face and it's going to look different. And yeah. so I think that caused a lot of people to look at me in a negative way because I would get comments like, Oh, that's a man. Or mm. I laugh at this. I was doing a section on nuts and dried fruit. We went around the supermarket. This post, I don't get it. It got like 25,000 views, which was probably the most I've ever had. Wow. And I got so many hate in the, the nut aisle of the grocery store. They're like, oh, you're so concerned about nuts. Uh, it's not that big a deal. You're about to grow your own nuts. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh, like, no. like, this <laughs> needs to stop because – Either, either I'm going to just ignore it and keep going on and jump off a bridge. Like, what's going to happen? So I think that it is, it is valuable to bring up that social media, you know, can really affect your psyche and your mental health if you let it. And luckily, yeah. 
Sometimes they catch it before I do because they have access to my account. So nobody send me any dirty pictures because they could see it. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but yeah, it's like, it's good to have somebody on your team to be like, I see what you're seeing. You just got to stick to the mission. Yeah. And not worry about them because nobody with a wolf profile picture with no followers and no posts with a private account is doing anything good mm -hmm. if they're accusing you or or um uh what do you call it like uh being demeaning to you like why would you be demeaning to someone you know doing something less than you yeah. of course they're going to pick on somebody doing more and they're always going to have their opinions which Mm, yeah, that's kind of led into that whole like, you know, masculine feminine battle being in college sports, being a coach, being thick skinned, being in locker rooms. It was really a struggle for me to be like, well, mm. how do I be nurturing when now I'm like in the shark tank of Instagram getting yeah. this and it happens just often enough that just when I think I'm over it, another troll will come out. But it's not like rapid fire the way it would be if I had like a million followers. Sure, I understand. So I'm that. kind of in, the, in that tweener stage where I'm like, oh, it's going to only get worse because we're not stopping the content anytime soon. Yeah, and that's the thing that to recognize, like whether we are off season or whether we are lean, we're always going to look like too much. We're always going to look like a man. We're always going to look like unhealthy, and it's not theoretically a healthy sport. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you yeah, do the the getting lean thing for a stage day, and then you're done. Yeah, And people don't understand, like, we're not walking around like that year round. We're also not walking around huge year round. But if we do have a slip up and we eat a little bit too much apple pie, like, we're human too. So yeah, it, sure. they don't understand the life. And I have to keep that in mind. Yeah, no, I understand that. I, um, <clears throat> my interview with, um, with um, Julia Di Pompeo yesterday, who's a figure competitor, we just talked a little bit about how social media is can often be anti-social media because you do get these just trolls that are hating life and then they take it out on on you and just say nasty things. So yeah, but I, I know that can kind of play in your psyche and and um yeah, just some mean people out there, you know, but they've got their their own miserable lives to deal with, I guess. <laughs> I know, and I and I kind of feel like, you know, I I thought about saying this and I was like, don't go down this road because when two idiots are arguing, no one could tell the difference. <laughs> yeah. Of who's not the idiot. But it was like, I almost wanted to say to someone, like, you know what? If you contribute to your social media unprivated with valuable information, like, I'm not here for your entertainment. Like, someone was saying mean things in the comments and then tried to play it off that comments are for entertainment. I'm like, not when I'm educating you on how to pick a coffee creamer. Like, there's no way to make a mean comment be like mm -hmm. entertainment. I'm like, you want entertainment? Kevin Hart's got a great page. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's freezing tough. up on me a little bit there. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's okay. It's It's tough, but, you know. That's part of the emotional intelligence that I'm working on, realizing that yeah. if you stay laser focused, nobody else matters. And there are people yeah. that love you. There are people that support you. And it's a disservice to the people that do care for you to want to throw in the towel for the person that is probably a 12 year old sitting behind a, a no profile picture saying mm -hmm. mean things. And yeah. when someone put it in perspective like that for me, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to focus on loving the people that love and support me and mm -hmm. that I have to be my biggest love. And when I started questioning that because of somebody else's opinion, I was like, no, we're not doing this. <laughs> yeah. Especially a stranger's opinion that, yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that's a good, good way to, to do, to, to be. Yeah. It was like uh, insulting to you. Cause you, you know, for example, you support all of us. So if I let them get most of my attention, but I don't give, you know, respect and thanks to the people that do support us or me, mm -hmm. it's like, you forget like you do have good things in front of you when you yeah. focus on the wrong things. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. I, yeah. I agree with you on that. Um, I, I just have a few miscellaneous questions for the end of the interview. And I was curious, yeah. um, do you, and you talked a little bit about it. Do you like to show off your muscles in public um, or do you prefer to stay covered up? And I know you're in Miami, so you could pretty much do a tank top year round up down there. <laughs> I know. And I, 
I'm not a heavy sweater, but I'm a very like, I don't want things on me. So I am a tank top person. I despise sleeves and when I have to wear sleeves and it's not because I want to show it off. I just don't want anything touching me. Sure. Um, so people see it because I, you know, I don't really want to be clothed, uh -huh. but I just placed an order for a shirt and I just got it today. It's a sweatshirt. It's a big black hoodie. And on the front, it says, leave me alone. And I'm like, let's see how long this lasts. Cause I'm like, this would be a perfect cardio shirt, but it's already like 80 degrees here in February. So it's not going to get any better. And trying to yeah. wear that in like June <laughs> to do like an hour of cardio, I'm going to like die. So <laughs> I bought that as a joke and my coach didn't see it yet. But when I go to the gym and I wear it, cause he says too many people know you, too many people are talking to you when you're here by yourself and you're not with me, tell them kindly that you cannot talk until the end of the session and just get after it. So he's like, I don't care if I have to buy you a shirt that says, leave me alone. So I went and found one. That's awesome. I love that. That's great. <laughs> but I almost like, I'm almost reserving it for like the end of prep because I know going to the grocery store with veins all sticking out. And when you carry grocery bags, they like pop out even more. I'm like, yeah. I don't want to deal with this. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> it's going to be like the dead nine, 97 degrees in July. And we wearing this leave me alone hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it, that could just like spur more discussion too. You, it could backfire on you. <laughs> I know, but like to actually answer the question, like I don't really like to show it off unless it's like me the day after the show and I'm like shooting with Sean Nelson or something. And like, yeah. oh, and it's like the time when I'm like all carved up and tan. But other than that, like I, I don't really like to show it off. I just don't like to wear a lot of clothes. Sure, I understand that. That totally makes sense. Yeah. Especially in Miami. I mean, geez, it's hot down there. It's, Hotter it's hot here <laughs> in Tampa. So um, I was curious if, if you were in a leadership position, um, what would you do to improve the sport of bodybuilding and what would you do to make the sport better? Well, first, I kind of want to highlight someone that I, I really respect, especially over the years with her, her grace, with everything that, whether it's winning or not winning, um, is like Natalia Coelho. Yeah, I look at her in my division as somebody who is the ultimate with just loving what she does every day. And we're not, you know, we're not close friends. We don't know each other, well, uh -huh. personally at least. Um, so I, I say this as like a fan kind of, yeah. um, because if you if you're intelligent enough to see the people who are paving the way that it should be, she naturally is young appears emotionally intelligent and enjoys what she does every day. And you never see her with a, with a, a nasty attitude or face. And I look at that as like, okay, That's Christina, good. like you're like double her age. You need to take a lesson in humility and love for the sport because sometimes I'm the, on the opposite side where I let so many things stress me out that I wear it on my face. I wear it on my sleeve. Now I'm going to be wearing it on my sweatshirt. Right. Uh -huh. And yeah. <laughs> I think what improves the sport is more people like her. And I look at her, Mm -hmm. and think like, what can you do, Christina, today to be more positive, more, you know, all about the craft of bodybuilding rather than about yourself? Like, yes, there's a selfish element. Like you can't go out, you can't really entertain nonsense and, you know, friends may feel a certain way about it, but she has a way of not showing it ever as a resentful thing where there are times I've been in prep that I've been miserable and I'm like, you shouldn't do things that make you miserable, but if this yeah. really makes you happy, you should show more of the happy side. So I feel like this mm -hmm. year my mission, like, what would Natalia do? You know, how would Natalia smile? Like show the joy of what we have a blessing and opportunity to do and emulate the people that make the sport a great place. And I'm so thrilled for her that, that she won the Olympia this year because yeah, some competitors are not so nice. And I, and I love seeing it go to someone like her. I've been kind of in her, her corner without her even knowing who I am <laughs> just oh, this yeah. whole time because I, I love her demeanor. And I think to improve the sport, we each have to individually improve, myself included, with attitude, presentation, and preserving femininity. Yeah, she. I was pleased with her, too. She And she. I know what you mean. I, she always seems very positive, really upbeat. You know, she seems like a really good ambassador for the sport. So, yeah, that's really cool. So you might have to do yeah. it. WWND, what would Natalia do? Sure. Maybe. Start a movement. 
<laughs> if, if she's down with that, like, and she sees this, like, give me a call. We'll start the WWND movement because I like, I'm, I'm literally the biggest fan of trying to stay as positive as you can. And there's a, a saying that people, you know, kind of said before where like bodybuilding is like a sort of like a luxury sport. Like you pay so much to put yourself under voluntary torture, to have a body that's like completely not sustainable. And mm-hmm. then we bitch about it. Like, so it's kind of like, it's kind of like a bratty thing to do when you don't have the right attitude. So when I think yeah. about, we do this because we love it. So let's show more of that. And then collectively, you know, I, I think it does preserve the feminine side of being a female because when I'm in the gym with a male trainer, I, like I literally turn into a raging bull and I don't want to see anybody and I don't want to talk to anybody, but I've been trying to like literally find ways in between gasping for air to make my trainer laugh so that he knows I hate you, but I'm still going to joke with you because it's how I'm going to get through this hour. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> so he brings my little, my little nurturing feminine lighthearted side out while I'm like feeling like a raging bull. That's awesome though. That's cool. <laughs> um, I was curious, do you find it tough um, mentally with like body image issues to go from, I I, I should reverse this from lean competition condition back to kind of the bulking off season phase? Because I think I know, you know, from this podcast that a lot of women struggle with that, but how do you feel about that? I think, I think collectively it's safe to say that we all hate it but we know it's a necessary thing to hormonally get more balanced and to put on quality muscle mass. And, you know, some people like to have a standard, right? Like I've had coaches that have said to me over the years, like you shouldn't have to gain more than 15, 20 pounds in the worst. And I'm like, please, like there are years where I've been like 40 or 50 pounds over in the off season. But when you have like all your glycogen stores full and then you're getting a little bit of water and you're getting fat, like it, it goes on there. It's not ideal, but it happens. Yeah. And it's hard for me definitely because it's so extreme that being a typical fitness influencer, you can have a lot more balance and you don't have that anxiety over like vascularity and striations and things like that. And mm-hmm. that's, That's really like to set yourself up, you basically need to prep for a prep. So you start prep at a place where your body composition is ideal to make the actual prep not so hard. So when you do go and you do what I've done way too many times, which is why I empathize with some of my lifestyle clients that just can't get, get it together. Like I can't complain because I have bounced in the wrong direction. And this year was hard for me, especially since I spent like tons of money on creating content and then to see it and then be called a man. I was like, I'm not proud of that at all. Mm, Um, But I'm interested to listen to some of your other podcasts with some of the other women, because I actually have had this complex my whole life. You know, I was always a meat and potatoes kid. Um, I wasn't always the most fit when I got to middle school and did the presidential fitness assessment. I sucked at it. It was really kind of like, Hmm. hit my soul. And then I started really getting into fitness to change that. And I I was that kid that never wanted to get changed in the locker room for gym class because I was always bigger than the other kids, not necessarily Hmm. fat, but like there were small girls too. And Hmm. I'm still larger than some of my friends. I still tower over them at five, five. And I, so it brings back those memories. So it's, I think it's a lot harder for us who've struggled with it Mm -hmm. all through life. Yeah, I understand. Just see yourself at 190 pounds, knowing that a few months earlier you were at 150 and shredded. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, bodybuilders, I, I, I find it fascinating that you go through such a huge transformation, both getting leaner and then and then back. And um, but I personally, I like all the phases. I think, um, and but I, I can t- totally understand the mental aspect behind it too. Because um, you know when you just go a little too far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I felt that all of the time. And the only thing you could do is go back to the habits that made you feel comfortable. So I would say the most comfortable I am in the phase. And I kind of know weight now, even though every year it changes because, you know, with more or less muscle tissue or whatever. But mm-hmm. when I hit the 160s, I'm like, this is my fighting weight. I can, I can run if I want to, cause things don't hurt. I feel light. I feel airy. I feel happy. I have got ab lines. My quads are starting to come out. But then when you go toward 150, like that's like, okay, that's my stage weight. Now I'm depleted of water and 
it doesn't feel very good at all. And yeah. except for the last day where you're eating carbs, <laughs> you know? So uh -huh. it's, I like the in-between stage. I like the in pursuit of it, but yeah. I've never stopped it there because it's in pursuit. So to reverse it, you really have to be committed to your reverse diet. So that yeah. you don't go back. Cause there's no reason why I should have gained 40, 50 pounds any of these years, but mm. yeah, I understand. It's a mental repercussion for sure, because it happens. Yeah, totally. I understand that. Yeah. Um, I just have one more question for you. And it's funny you mentioned reality TV, <laughs> but I was wondering, like, how do we get bodybuilding back on TV again? And um, because I remember when I was a kid, ESPN and NBC, you know, would cover women's bodybuilding pretty regularly. And it introduced the sport to a lot of people who didn't know about it. But, you know, there's no major TV network that's really covering it anymore and hasn't been for years. So I don't know. What do you think about getting it back on TV? I wish I had the answer. And part of me wonders, like with the, all of the streaming networks, you know, maybe not like Netflix, but something like Roku, where people can have like a maybe a private network of their own or private channel on there. Mm -hmm. Is it as hard as we think to get it back on there? Or is there a sponsor that's willing to try to put, you know, stuff on there? I, I think mm -hmm. I actually spoke with someone a while back. I, I guess I wasn't cast for it, but it was an HBO special on women's bodybuilding. And I never heard back. So I guess I'm not on it. But they yeah. were going to do a documentary on women's bodybuilding and like how hard it is. Um, yeah. Okay. I cool. watch TV, so I don't even know if it ever came out or if whatever happened. Yeah, but the documentary, I, I guess, would be the start because what you're doing is almost like, I mean, shy of following us around for a day or two or whatever. This is like the most humanizing experience to put a human being with the sport rather than, you know, there's a specific YouTube channel that my friend was featured on that it spun the editing in such a negative way that like you cannot even pop like I'm in there like the comment warrior defending her and like being like you're so mean to all the comments but the editing mm -hmm. really does either paint a good or bad picture mm -hmm. and, yeah I understand you know unfortunately you get a lot of these like viral YouTube things that show the downside rather than the human side and more yeah. people than not want to feed into the negative and the positive. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what would be the best combination to show the human side, because people are always going to have a weird phobia or fetish about muscles. People are always going to see physical changes and, you know, accuse everybody of doing testosterone or whatever. Like people are going to have their own opinions yeah. regardless, but I I'm still wondering how we can bring women's bodybuilding in all divisions to a positive light to show, you know, what is it like to date somebody that brings their lunch everywhere? Like, what is it like to be in the house with a bodybuilding couple? Like mm -hmm. I've taken cucumbers to the movies and been okay with it. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would love for people to see like as much as you want to watch like documentaries about Kobe and what his day was like. Yeah, to showcase women and what we go through. Not that we need a special, you know, ticket to 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 be accepted, but there, it's hard as a woman. People expect this to be manly, and we do it because we love it, not to impress anybody. And I think yeah. that's what needs to be portrayed. I think that would be great. I would, yeah. I think I'd love to see that. So now um, we have to find networks. <laughs> I know. And um, yeah, and like the Muscle Mamas show i think i think that'd be awesome i think that'd be kind of interesting to watch <laughs> and it, it you could see that be... on like lifetime network <laughs> yeah lifetime or something like that yeah or um or yeah netflix even you know netflix series or something so yeah <laughs> yeah i'll have to find people i know some people in reality tv i like I should be hitting them up about this i'll have to yeah find out what the reality of it is that might be kind of cool um i was just curious if there's anything that i um, neglected to ask that you'd like to bring up for the podcast before we finish? No, I'm just real appreciative for a chance to have a platform to, you know, bring a positive light to the sport. And, and I think one thing I actually do a poor job of, so this is more of like an announcement to other like women that are watching. I've, I've enjoyed meeting other women at shows. I've met some of my best friends at shows and I feel like 
being more supportive on social media is somewhere that I lack. So if, if anybody is a fellow competitor that, you know, feels like they want to reach out or has more questions about experience or whatever, or just like, you know, when you're going through prep, you need a buddy that gets it. So I think that's one way we can just increase our sisterhood together um, sure. and not leave it to when shows happen. But backstage is where a lot of those relationships start and, yeah, I've met a lot of amazing women over the years. And unfortunately, it's like the more you compete, the more you meet them. But if you only do one show a year, every other year, you're kind of limited. So I would yeah. just say, hey, if anything resonated with you and you need an ear, we got to we got to link up. <laughs> and I'll include your Instagram, too, in, in the on the YouTube channel so people can see. Um, awesome. One thing I did neglect to ask, you mentioned your coach. And I'd like to highlight your coach um, down in the comments, too. But what is his name? Oh, he is not a social media person. He flies under the radar. Oh, cool. Um, okay. Yeah, so there's no way to – I mean, he's got an email, but um, but I'll get an idea from him if he, if he wants to be tagged with his email because yeah. he just loves the in-person. He's not really doing online. And it, okay, sure. It, it's, it's a different change from doing – I've had some amazing coaches over the years that are very high-profile, and I love them all, but – being in person now, I'm like, I'm like, just need that person that's just gonna pull up my skin and be like, what did you do? Oh yeah, I understand. <laughs> but unfortunately, he's not a social media person, doesn't want to deal with it, but he's excellent at what he does. So that's awesome. Very cool. And could you do a quick uh, flex for me? With my little biceps coming. You look great. A little skin on top. <laughs> <laughs> no, you look awesome. It's coming. Give me a few more weeks. No, you're gonna do great. Um, well, thank you so much, Christina. It's really nice um, to get to meet you virtually, and and um, I'll get this posted relatively soon too. But I'll I'll keep you posted. But thanks so much, and I really appreciate all your positive comments about me. I didn't expect that, so that was really sweet. So thank you. No, of course, of course. I think people don't realize how powerful this is, and I, I really hope that the channel takes off and and people learn a lot more about all of us. And I'm going to go check it out myself and get to know my other sisters and strength. That's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, Anytime. Um, uh, take care. You too.